The story starts with two players playing a game of war. The Nebula army which consisted of human and other mixed races will be battling against the Hegemony army which consisted of orcs. The game concept is that you play as god, and lead your civilization to victory by battling other players' civilization. It's like playing a game of chess. The title of the story is at the bottom. You can't have full reign on your armies, as they have their own AI free will, but you can use some of your godly skills to aid your army. Like our MC here, Nebula, with his nuclear strike and hegemony, who counterattacked with his anti-ballistic missiles. Nevertheless, the other nuclear bomb that Nebula launched into space came plunging down towards the Orc's Holy Shrine, which is technically the source of the Orc army's power as well as their god's medium. Normally in this type of situation, praying is pointless. But in perished world, where one's faith always produces results, the players who act as their civilization's god will always provide miracles for their believers. Nebula recognized this strategy used is called the Holy Orc. Hegemony smugly announced that this is the freshly optimized Holy Orc strat. Hegemony is ranked number two in the server. Nebula realized where Hegemony's confidence stems from. Even though orcs are an easy race to recruit, it's amicable to have gathered so much faith already. Nebula applauded Hegemony for preparing a spirit apostle to counter his sky attacks. However, our MC is still one step ahead. He released a few tungsten rods from outer space, and Hegemony panicky tried to get the spirit apostle to block it. Nevertheless, with added acceleration due to gravity pull, the tungsten rods went through the spirit apostle and crashed down towards the orc city. As a result, the orc emperor died and the imperial palace and underground temple collapsed. All the faith that Hegemony had collected up to this point, all gone. When faith disappears, the apostle perishes. Nebula applauded Hegemony's hard work as Nebula once again sits at the first rank. Hegemony demanded a rematch but our MC declined as it was too boring. He already dominated the first rank for two months in a row and completed the achievement. While he's trying to retire for the day, a message popped out. It was a message complimenting him as he's the only one who completed all of the achievements to date, they also thanked him for enjoying the game. Our MC thought the devs are ending the game but apparently the beta testing has ended and it will be a public game. However, our MC could enjoy the game before it goes live. Our MC didn't realize that he was playing a beta game and when a notification asked him to enter the public game, he entered it without any hesitation. When he opened his eyes, he was in front of a temple-like ruin with an altar in the middle. He even looks like his in-game avatar, he thought it to be a dream but a person confirmed that he was chosen. Nebula was chosen. That person introduced themselves as Aladdin. Nebula wondered how did they know his player name and more importantly, what are those shadowy figures over there? For easier explanation, Aladdin brought up a planet that looks like Earth. However, it was perished world, which Nebula had seen countless times in game. Aladdin turned towards Nebula and the shadowy figures and told them that they will become true gods to perished world. Perished world wasn't merely a world in a game, it's a land that was abandoned by gods due to an event in the past. It was once a glorious planet where many civilizations lived in harmony and thrived, but for some unknown reasons, the existing gods abandoned the world and it is now in dire need of new gods. The game was created to discover such godly candidates for this planet. You can imagine the game to be somewhat like a start of a certain religion. At first, they will only have the humble and lowly believing in their religion, but as the believers increased, they could become the sole god of this planet. Every desire they desired can be realized when they become the god of this world. If they wish to give up right now, they can return to their previous lives with their memories of being isekai erased. If they choose to start the challenge, they won't be able to quit mid-challenge. If they are defeated by another god, they will meet their true end. They are risking their lives by playing this deadly game of gods. Yet, our MC favors this deadly thrill. Aladdin let the god candidates choose whether to go home or win big. As for the ones who want to win the big money, they will have to play a gotcha game to earn their small starter region, just like in the game. Our MC noticed that 5 out of the 32 people decided to pack their bags and leave, which leaves 27 candidates left. Aladdin invited Nebula to pick a card first, as soon as he saw his gotcha result, he cursed, and was immediately teleported away towards a small region near the sea. Within that particular region, there are frogmen in the vicinity. 
The gotcha that Nebula pulled is in the small region with insects as his starting medium, meaning he has full control of insects but the win rate is the lowest. Insects are the subversions of birds but are still useful in early game. The thing that bothered RMC is the fact that his starting point is too far east of the continent where less combat happens. He won't be able to gain early advantages so he can't use an aggressive strategy. As he controls insects, the frogmen who feed on insects are a good start but the frogmen numbers are too many. He only has 10 faiths and is not enough to influence this many frogmen. Nebula scouted for another nearby race and found lizardmen that are traversing the desert which also can feed on insects. They can survive without much water and are lower in numbers as well. Additionally, they are sick lizardmen, old ones, and a particularly wounded one. Nebula deduced that this small tribe was expelled from their original lands. Therefore, it is easier for Nebula to influence them, as they are exhausted and felt that the world has abandoned them. Nebula started with the one whose mind is the most fragile, the particularly injured lizardman who was lagging behind the group. Since you watched until here, why not like, subscribe, and share, much thanks. The exhausted and hungry lizardmen spotted a wounded gazelle and they pounced on it. The healthy ones get to eat first, which makes the old and sick ones despaired as they could only stare at the strong ones devouring the gazelle. In just a few minutes, that once alive gazelle is reduced to a pile of bones. Before the healthy ones could continue licking the bones dry, the bone was snatched away, the lizard man who snatched the bone wanted to at least leave these bone marrow for the old and sick. The old and sick devoured the remaining bone marrow, and the particularly wounded lizard man had to crunch on the bones itself. The healthy lizard man asked if it was worth it giving some to the old and sick as they are going to die anyways, especially the particularly wounded one who's supposed to kick the bucket a long time ago. The wounded lizard man named, Lockrack, got his deep injury when he defended the group against a saber-toothed tiger. The kind lizard man wanted them to be grateful to him instead of being an ass. At night, the lizard man cuddled up for warmth, except for Lockrack who was freezing. Suddenly, he noticed a butterfly hovering above him and flew towards a rocky mountain as if telling him to follow it. A lizard man who was awake thought that Lockrack was leaving the group, so they let the injured lizard man leave quietly. Lockrack thought that his mind was so weary to the point of seeing illusions as he was the only one who noticed the abnormal butterfly in the desert. Nevertheless, he still followed the blue butterfly. As he reaches the top, he is baffled to find a tower of bugs in front of him. It's even enough to feed the whole lounge. A system popped up at Nebula's end, stating that the Lizardman pack has encountered a revelation. As Nebula was checking out the live footage, he was shocked and impressed that Lockrack shared the food with the group by himself without needing Nebula to interfere. Lockrack named his newfound god as the Nameless Beetle God. Nebula was once astonished by Lockrack's naming sense, but Nebula never started with a good name anyways. The Lizardman Lockrack will become an important piece for Nebula and of course, he will be returning the favor to that Lizardman too. The next day, the group followed the butterfly with Lockrack leading, because he is the only one who can see it. After the beetle feast, they are already dubbing Lockrack as the leader of the group. Lockrack is worried if they continue following his butterfly visions, they might end up freezing to death as the direction his vision is leading him is towards a soon-to-be winterland. A lizard man asked if they should ignore it and head to the opposite direction of the vision. However, there's absolutely nothing in that direction for them to survive. Lockrack doesn't know if his visions have any purpose but he can only bet everything on it. This doubtful attitude is normal because Nebula doesn't have enough faith yet. Nebula looked at the insect sanctification skill that needed him to be level 2 or higher, and 10 faiths to unlock. Nebula hopes that Lockrack believes in him so that he can bestow them with an unimaginable future. Religiously following his visions, Lockrack and the group found an oasis, and his faith in the nameless beetle god became stronger. Nebula's god level and sub-area insect level has increased to level 2 respectively. He can now use insect sanctification. Nebula made Lockrack his priest and bestowed a blessing that could help Lockrack. At night when everyone was asleep peacefully, a firefly perched on Lockrack's arm. The lizard man heard someone calling his name, when he opened his eyes, he was in a space with butterflies fluttering around and he thought this to be a dream. Suddenly, someone called his name again and he thought he saw his god before him. His god extended his hand and Lockrack wondered if he wanted him to grab his hand or if his god wanted to ask him something. The extended hand points down, 
and Lockrack realizes that he's suddenly holding a skull with horns in his hands. Lockrack took a good look at the skull. Suddenly, his body moved by itself. He slowly placed the skull on his god and it was Nebula's character customization. Lockrack realized that this is his nameless beetle god. The next morning, he told everyone his dream. The lizardmen asked if their god wanted them to sacrifice a buffalo to him as it's a buffalo skull. But hunting buffaloes are dangerous and require all manpower to hunt. If so, who will protect the weak ones? Lockrack said that he will go alone as he didn't want to risk the lounge. The lizardmen tried to stop him from committing suicide but Lockrack said that his god gave him a blessing. His previous wounds are all healed and his shoulders are now covered in black scales, which is just like a beetle. The lizard man still wasn't convinced and Lockrack showed them his other blessing. He tossed his spear towards the tree and with great force, the spear pierced the tree down. The lizard men were literally jaw dropped. They exclaimed if Lockrack was hiding his power all this time. An old lizard man was shocked that the Lockrack that was dying not long ago became this strong. At that moment, just as if was fate, there's a herd of buffaloes coincidentally stampeding at the foot of their hill. That hard to convince lizard man was shocked that the buffalo herd was here despite this route is not the buffalo's usual migrating route. Lockrack smiled and leaped down. Today we shall be free from hunger, he shouted, and shot his spear towards a buffalo's head. With Lockrack's successful hunt, other lizard men followed suit. They shouted that their god's grace doesn't only extend to beetles but also fresh meat. After the hunt, they stacked the buffalo skulls together and did a blood ritual. This is really becoming like a demonic cult, huh? Lockrack led the ritual and offered the offerings to the nameless beetle god. Because the lounge witnessed the food miracle, other lizardmen started to join in the Nebula cult. Nebula doesn't mind the clumsy offering as their sincerity is what's important. His 162 faith exceeded his initial expectations. It was a decent sacrifice from a novice priest. In spite of that, Nebula cannot materialize water nor grass for the buffaloes to come to the lizardmen. He just controlled the locust to lead the buffaloes to patches of grasses along the way. Nebula looked at the lizardmen who consumed all the buffaloes that they hunt, it's hard to expect cattle raising knowledge from them at the beginning. To add to that, this oasis spring can only sustain them for a few years at most. The lizardmen need to learn farming or herding if they want to survive the long term. But, Nebula cannot teach them directly either as it's against the rules. The lizardmen lounge just needed time to figure it out. Our MC bestowed them a small blessing which changes the color of their scales. The next day, Lockrack went to check the bone altar as he had a disturbing dream last night. He saw the altar trembling, the fishes disappeared, and ground over farm to the point that it's barren. The lizard man said that it's not that bad yet, and Lockrack to not worry as their god is taking care of them. Lockrack climbs the altar and says that he trusts his god, but sometimes if they don't understand the meanings behind his messages, they will be going against their god's will and he is just afraid of that. Suddenly, Lockrack saw something from above and urged Zael, the lizard man whom he was talking to, to come up. Zael came up and they saw a group approaching. Lockrack finally understood why the altar in his dream is shaking. That group are the ones who will drive them out from the oasis. It was another group of lizardmen with their leader riding a humongous lizard pet. Lockrack and Zael recognized this group to be the same one who drove them out from their previous home. They judged their previous home to be already devastated for this tribe to be moving again. Zael is anxious that the Blue Leather tribe is aiming for their oasis but the tribe doesn't know the existence of this oasis yet. Zael hoped that the tribe would pass their mountain without realizing anything. But Yuri from the patrol team, who doesn't have the word stealth, in his dictionary just had to make their presence known to the Blue Leather tribe. Lockrack and Zael felt a throbbing headache. Yet, Lockrack also sees this as the will of their god. This might be a mission to assimilate this blue leather tribe with their own and save them. Zael asked why would their god drive their rival group towards them once more, after that rival group basically chased them out from their original home. At that moment, Lockrack saw Nebula's butterfly again, he is firm that this is his god's will and he won't dare question his god. He will only play his role as Nebula's apostle. With that, Lockrack with his spear in hand followed the butterfly towards the rival tribe. Nebula was very pleased that Lockrack understood his messages very well. 
Nebula wanted the merge of the two tribes for population growth and technological advancement. He is surprised that Lockrack made the decision all by himself. Lockrack's strong will drove him to make the decisions that Nebula wanted. Our MC is very fond of a strong-willed leader. He wanted to instill a stronger belief into Lockrack even more, so that he can sit down and relax as he doesn't have to babysit Lockrack too much. Meanwhile, the fat lizard man who's sitting on the pet monster smugly asked the patrol team if this is their home. The hot-headed patrol team gave him the information that he wanted. Oh, what could possibly be here? The overweight lizard man smugly asked. Trees, shrubs, life, and our god. The one replying to him was Lockrack who came to greet them. Lockrack told them that this is the realm of the nameless beetle god. The fat lizard man demanded Lockrack's group to leave, or he would attack them as the pet monster hissed. The fat lizard man told Lockrack to do some math and realize that they are outnumbered. As making peace isn't going well, Lockrack decided to use force instead. Like a true priest, Lockrack told the rival group that he would assimilate them into his group as per his god's will. The fat lizard man laughed and gave failing marks to Lockrack's math skills. However, Lockrack doesn't need math when he has his god to trust. The fat lizard man directs his pet monster to attack. Lockrack prayed to his god to bestow him with strength to conquer this adversity in front of him. Lockrack's spear was broken by the pet monster and was about to get stomped by it. A system window popped out, saying that it's a clash of civilizations and both civilizations will receive a huge boost in experience. Nebula chose to aid one tribe that belongs within his domain, new skills have been unlocked and Nebula activated it. At that moment, Lockrack saw a star-shaped light come down from the heavens towards him. The pet monster's paw was brought down and the fat lizard man laughing at Lockrack's dismay. Yet, the pet monster didn't hit anything as Lockrack already evaded it, as his body was shrouded with a blue aura. He felt as if God had descended into his body. The fat lizard man scoffed and directed the pet monster to attack once more. Nebula used foresight at the fat lizard man. It has a warrior level 1, commander level 2, strength 24, intelligence 15, camaraderie 16, and has a breeding skill. This dude can be easily handled by Lockrack alone but the real problem is the pet monster, Manon, which is a level 1 drake, has 87 strength, 6 intelligence, and 9 camaraderie. Now we get to look at Lockrack's stats, he has a warrior level 2, commander level 2, apostle level 1, 30 strength, 24 intelligence, 26 camaraderie, 14 will, has a possessed title with divinity level 3 and with added buffs from Nebula it's more than enough to defeat the two. The title, possessed, grants the user an additional stat named divinity or the letter D. A single D is equal to 200 attribute points which is the maximum amount of points that a creature can receive naturally through a buff. To simply put, Lockrack's strength now is 630, which can toss the man and Drake easily. When the fat lizard realized it, they were already falling upside down. Everyone was shocked at the overwhelming display of strength. With that, Manon Drake was defeated. The fat lizard man crawled out from under Manon and cursed Lockrack from using a trick. He grabbed his knife and dashed towards Lockrack, however, Lockrack just gave the man an overwhelming slap with his 630 strength. The fat lizard man was defeated and Lockrack asked who's next. Everyone dropped their weapon and surrendered to Lockrack. After that, he felt God leaving his body it felt like a dream to him. At night, the assimilated lizardmen group gathered near the altar and got to know each other. The blue-scale lizardman couldn't believe that the tribe that was driven out that time had their scales discolored to black. The black-scale lizardman deemed it all thanks to their god for saving them. The blue-scale lizardman looked at the altar. They still couldn't believe their eyes that there's a lizardman with that kind of power. Zael asked Lockrack if it's okay to suddenly increase their population like this as it would make this oasis a desolate land even faster. Lockrack said that they should leave this place and the answer lies with this new group. There must be a reason why their god brought the rival group here. The next day, two black-scaled lizardmen were trying to get Manon to behave, but the drake wasn't complying to their will. Yuri came to aid and Manon tried to pounce. Lockrack came to save the day and Manon recalled the overwhelming difference in power. It became docile and Lockrack gave it food. Manon took a few anxious sniffs before eating the food, everyone was surprised that Lockrack easily tamed the bad boy Manon. 
While looking at Manon eating, Lokrak thought that there's also a reason for their god to keep it alive. Manon wanted more food but Lokrak told it to be a patient boy if it wants to follow them. The little drake became a good boy. After that, Lokrak had a meeting with a blacksmith from the Blue Scale group. He had the skills to make spear heads but lacked the wood resources. Lokrak shared some wood with him, and also found out that they used burnt wood to make a special fuel for campfires. Lokrak dismissed this lizard man and came another blue scale lizard man. He heard that Lokrak is looking for a guide. You must be the wanderer. Lokrak said. The single arm wanderer laughed and admitted that he indeed wanders around looking for a home. During that time, he learned how to see pathways. He knows a few food abundant lands, but he isn't sure if they are still uninhabited. Lokrak doesn't mind defeating them and taking the land if the occupants are hostile. The wanderer also doesn't mind Lokrak's mindset. Lokrak then asked him if he can believe the same faith as him. The wanderer points up and says that his answer lies with the stars. He says that if they know how to read the stars they won't lose their way. Seeing that Lokrak is a little skeptical, the wanderer will tell him the current star pathway and if he proves his point, he hopes that Lokrak would believe him. With that, Lokrak got some astrology classes and they will check on them tomorrow again. Then came Yuri, Lokrak asked if he's here cause of Manon but the drake is a good boy after that. Yuri is here because he had a lightbulb moment when Lokrak tamed Manon. He asked if they could tame another species for food sustenance. He pointed towards the buffaloes outside and asked if they could tame them. With that, Lokrak's tribe discovered livestock farming. Nebula learned that human history is said to be divided into agriculture and livestock production from the game. Agriculture is more stable but he chose lizardmen to start. They have strong physiques and high environmental adaptability. Thus, they are more suited to do livestock production rather than agriculture. In addition, the lizardmen needed new innovations like iron to advance further. Lokrak and Zale were watching the blue-scale blacksmiths do their weapon-making jobs. Nebula was pleased that they can already make primitive iron tools, although it's still weaker than bronze but it's a step up from only using stones. Our MC is literally watching a live stream right now. He is also happy that they are dabbling into astronomy. Although it's still newbie level, but Nebula hopes that the stargazer will further his astronomy studies. After a few days of stargazing, Lokrak is convinced that the stars are indeed useful. The tribe members were gathered for Lokrak's good words. He praised their god for getting all of them back together, they can choose to do it solo but their god forgave them and gifted everyone longer lives. They would have sinned if they didn't choose to merge as god bestowed salvation and not exilement. Moreover, they benefited with greater numbers too. Lokrak announced that they will leave this place tomorrow morning, he called forth the stargazer. He declared that the stargazer will be their official guide. The stargazer told the group that they will head south and after walking for ten days, they will pass a rotten lake. After three more days traveling south and three days traversing mountains and valleys, they will reach an endless forest which might be a good place to live in. Lokrak thanked the stargazer and called forth Yuri as well. He wanted Yuri to tell them why didn't he eat any of the buffaloes he hunted yesterday. Yuri thought that he did something wrong and anxiously tried to explain. He said that if they refrain from eating the buffaloes right now, they could eat it in the future when they are truly starving. Lokrak praised Yuri and he was dumbstruck. Lokrak complimented Yuri for restraining himself for the tribe's future. Yuri vowed to do this in the future as well, as long as he's not starving. To commend Yuri's actions, he was bestowed a spear made out of iron. The stunned lizard man stared at his prize in awe. Lokrak also gave the spear prizes to those who restrained themselves like Yuri. Everyone was happy. Lokrak is using a reward system to commend good behaviors. Then, Lokrak picked up a buffalo skull from the altar and wore it. He wanted the warriors to stand before him one by one. He gave Yuri a buffalo skull and dubbed Yuri a skeleton warrior as God wills. The lizardman's morale skyrocketed. Morning came and Lokrak's tribe will depart this safe haven. As long as their god is by their side, they will be where they belong. Lokrak shouted for everyone to embody their god's name within them, he cannot guarantee a life free of suffering but they will march forward towards their Eden. Everyone chanted and the tribe's morale was at its highest. Lokrak apologized to his god for using his name to boost morale. 
However, Nebula is fine with the way Lockrack does things. Additionally, Lockrack even furthered their growth which is amazing. Yuri's trust increased to level 7 from level 4 and his warrior skill increased to level 3. Lockrack also upped his stats, with his leadership being from level 7 to 14, priest from level 1 to 2 and warrior from level 2 to 3. The apostle the nebula chose had never disappointed him so far and the real game begins now. It was a scorching morning and even Manon collapsed from the scarce resources. The group stopped for a short break. The group barely ate anything and is starting to doubt themselves. They have been traveling for three whole days, everyone is exhausted and food is running out as well. While Lockrack is muttering that he can't keep on relying on God's miracle, their scout comes informing them that there's another species ahead. It was a group of orcs. At first, the orcs are happy to take on Lockrack's group. But as soon as they saw Lockrack's group armed with a more advanced weaponry than them, they knew that they were outclassed. They got down to their knees and apologized. Lockrack shared some food with the orcs and they shared their story of wanting to leave the canyon ASAP. They all abandoned their homes and went into the wilderness. The orcs pointed at the hills not far, it was their previous home until a monster showed up. It was a giant centipede with ruins on its back. It's an ancient coleoptera, a level 9 abomination. Has three divinity added to its 12 strength, 12 intelligence, and 4 diplomacy. It is a creature created by the now dead ancient gods, after the gods disappeared, the creatures remained and roamed around. The players called those creatures, abominations. The centipede abomination has venomous fangs as its unique skill and the blessing of the forgotten gods. Nebula deemed it far too strong for Lockrack's group right now. But, it would take an extra 8 days for them to reach their destination if they go around the mountain. Nebula can relate to Lockrack's hesitation as it's hard to fight with his people so afraid. However, taking the long road isn't viable either. Nebula wanted to know what option his priest would choose. Zael looked around at the huge boulders around the cliff, and told Lockrack that they must fight. Zael has level 3 warrior, level 1 mediator, 26 strength, 35 intelligence, 28 diplomacy, and 11 intuition. Zael said that they have the advantage here. Zael wanted Lockrack to recall the bellow used by the blacksmiths to increase the furnace heat. The plan doesn't need to be too sophisticated, they just need to apply the concept of a bellow. With that, they acquired physics knowledge by using levers to lift and push the heavy boulders. Nebula was impressed with the thinking, but if they wanted to go up against the abomination, the boulders needed to be dropped at the same time. The lizardmen worked together and finally got a few boulders rolling down. Despite that, it only made a small crack on the centipede's head before the boulders were smashed into smithereens. Their plan failed and the centipede was furious. With the power of its many legs, the angry centipede crawled up the cliff towards the group. Lockrack shouted for the others to drop the remaining boulders. However, it was too late. Nebula descended into Lockrack once more. Using the newfound strength obtained, Lockrack managed to leverage the boulder by himself and continued pushing more boulders down. They have faint hope that the boulders will kill the centipede, so Lockrack had to add on with the damage. He held his breath and threw his spear towards the centipede with great force. The spear pierced through the ruins on the monster's back and stabbed its body. The abomination screeched in pain, in that split second, the boulders came crashing down the monster's head. It fell down the cliff and once again was crushed by the falling boulders. Lockrack landed successfully and Nebula is satisfied with the successful hunt. A system window pops out, stating that they have successfully hunted an abomination, ancient Coleoptera. The lizardmen cheered and Nebula's faith had risen. More importantly, he obtained the abomination essence from killing that centipede. Each god can create resources specific to their phylum, though it can be done by spending faith, to create a being that doesn't exist, he needed special resources. By obtaining the abomination essence, Nebula can create sacred beasts that exist solely to spread the word of its god within the world's domain. Furthermore, Nebula can level the sacred beasts and give them classes such as Apostle and Incarnation. Nebula wondered if the sacred beast's creation is still the same as in the game. But there's only one way to find out. The lizard men gathered around the centipede's carcass. Zael wondered if the meat is edible, even though it stinks. Zael tasted the meat, but it tasted like shit. 
I think we just can't eat it as it is, another lizard man suggested. Zale wondered if adding some flavor to it and burning it over a fire would make it edible. And so, they acquired the handy dandy cooking skill. The meat was bland but it's pretty edible. Lockrack applauded Zale's cooking skill and would like to learn it. While Lockrack was eating, Zale suggested that since even the orcs has an heir, Lockrack should find a mate too. The lizard man dropped his meat. Zale said that it is crucial for the stabilization of the lounge and they are also getting old. And if Lockrack never thought about a mate, why not choose Zale as his mate? To be honest, I never knew she was a she LMAO. Lockrack didn't seem to be phased with that sudden suggestion from the maiden. Suddenly, he noticed something behind Zale. It was a golden tablet with pictures and letters engraved on it. The tablet was inside the ruins of the centipede's back. Yuri bit the gold and confirmed that it isn't edible. The stargazer said that it's gold, and the blacksmiths also showed Zale gold before. She said that it is shiny and doesn't decolorize or decay over time, so it's worth a lot among the humans. Yuri complained that inedible stuff is useless and the stargazer suggested that he hunt a deer. They had never seen a deer before but the orcs have, so Yuri will talk to them ASAP. How hard did Yuri bite the gold for it to leave teeth marks lol. Anyways, Lockrack looks at this eternal golden tablet. Everything dies or decays over time, but this golden tablet doesn't. His smart brain guessed that the person who made this didn't want it to decay for some reason. His thoughts were reeled back by Zale who came to report that the group is ready to rest for the night. Lockrack asked how she found him when he didn't tell her his whereabouts. Zale just went around to find a lizard man with furred clothes as Lockrack is the only one who has them. Zale was also the one who suggested he wear those as she wanted the tribe's chief to have a unique symbol. After that, Lockrack stayed there until nightfall, thinking that that unique symbol too would rot one day. Suddenly, he noticed the flies from the deer were writing something in midair. The movements resembled the markings on the tablet and Lockrack had an eureka moment. It wasn't the gold that the person wants to preserve, but it was something else. Lockrack started drawing something on the ground. The next day, he woke up his potential mate. He wanted to show her something. Lockrack drew something on the sand and said that it represents a male lizard man. He drew another symbol again which represents Zale. Following the previous logic, Zale guessed that this is a female lizard man. The chief proceeds to draw an equal symbol between the two symbols. It tells us that they are each other's companions, and it's also my answer to the proposal you made to me. Lockrack rizzed up his partner. The partner took the stick and circled the symbols. She asked if he understands what it means and of course he does. And so, the Lockrack tribe is saved from extinction, thanks to Rizzer Lockrack, the Rizzard Man. Anyways, our MC is happy that the Lizard Man acquired written language. It'll take a long time for it to become a proper language but he's glad that he got it early. The Lizard Man even made catching the biggest prey animal and presenting it to their fiancé a wedding custom. Well, it isn't customary to catch the prey by hand, they could also use their smarts to catch it. And so, they acquired the trapping skills as well. After a few while, Lockrack gave the land with the dead centipede back to the orcs, they were immensely touched. The orc chief thanked Lockrack and introduced his heir to them. He hopes his son who knows the geography here better can help guide them. While scouting the forest, they found the footprint of a frogman. There are good and bad frogmen, they also have the ability to communicate. Judging by the footprints, there's at least five frogmen scouting the area they are at and they are also bigger than the lizardmen. Lockrack ordered them to go back to their base camp first. They put torches around their base camp for good lightning in the dark. Lockrack ordered them to build more houses to fool the frogmen that their numbers are bigger than it actually is. They will also need to increase security as the frogmen are most likely keeping tabs on them already. A few days later, they still haven't run into any frogmen. The lizardmen are already settling in their new environment with livestock farming estate development, and the progress of their written language. The primitive maps containing the combination of traditional hunter markings and new letters and writings are shared amongst the lounge members. They also kept individual records of their daily harvest to enhance their productivity. Additionally, Nebula's locust swarms that he uses to manipulate movements like the water buffaloes are also increasing steadily. Also, his phylum has reached level 4 and the lounge capabilities are all above average for now. 
However, there will soon be another crisis for the lounge. Lockrack received a report that the frogmen were making a move. The scene skipped and they are now face to face with a few frogmen. However, he also wondered why there is a lizard man amidst the frogs. The frogman with a fancy feather outfit introduced himself as Shunin, the son of the great tribal chief Aloy. He said that they come in peace. Lockrack introduced himself as well and said that he also came in peace but also asked them the reason they visited. Shunin came to check on the group that trespassed in their lands. Lockrack politely apologized as they didn't know that this is their land as there's no markings of ownerships. Nevertheless, he stated that they have no place to stay for now and would like to rest here. Before Shunin could continue to file them for trespassing. You appear to be someone who's qualified to allow us grace, am I right? Lockrack smoothly asked. The frogman got all mushy with the compliment that he is a superior figure and bestowed them the stay. His frog guards wanted to say something but they were in no place to question the heir of the tribe. Lockrack invited them to his village, however, Shunin declined, saying that they haven't reached mutual trust yet. So what about staying here and sharing some food? Lockrack asked, Shunin got the okay from his guard and accepted the food invitation. Lockrack is just buying some time to figure out what that lizard man is doing with the frogman but he can't reveal his intentions so early in this negotiation game. Lockrack asked about the feathers around Shunin's neck, the frogman proudly said that it's the feathers of a cockatrice. They are dangerous giant birds that live here, they are venomous and big so it's a hard catch. Lockrack asked if they use javelins to catch the birds. Shunin decided to flex to this country bumpkin, he ordered the lizard man in his group, Owen, to fetch his bow and arrows. After he brought it, he ordered him to find a plank for target practice. Lockrack watched this errand lizard do his work. Shunin then showed off his archery skills to Lockrack. He bragged that he's the best shooter in the tribe and Lockrack requested to try archery. The lizard man examined the bow and bowstring. His brain is already listing down the advantages of a bow and arrow. He is tempted to take a sample home and examine it closely. All of his arrows missed the target, Shunin comforted him and also didn't forget to make his little errand lizard do errands. Lockrack offered to pick the arrows with the errand boy lizard. Lockrack greeted Owen and the lizard man flinched. Lockrack asked the reason Owen is with the frogman. He told Lockrack that the lizard men here and the frogman live together and help each other. Lockrack was taken aback but Owen looked so happy in confirming that statement. Owen explained that the frogmen help them with combat and the lizardmen help pick fruits for them as frogmen cannot stay away from water too long. Lockrack said that lizardmen are capable of defending themselves, Owen frantically explained that the forest is dangerous and the Alloy tribe is the largest tribe here. Without them, we'd have a hard time surviving. Owen smiled awkwardly. Lockrack felt annoyed, he told him to tell the frogmen that they were talking about archery if they ask. After that, Shunin got his taste buds blessed by the power of spices. Seeing the frogman liking the taste, he asked if he wanted to trade live water buffaloes for bows. Shunin nearly agreed but was stopped by his guard's glare. Shunin awkwardly said that they will talk about that after they are closer, he also stated that their tribe isn't hostile to lizardmen, and used Owen as an example. He called out for Owen to explain how good their relationships are. Owen started to read his speech with a smile. However, Lockrack already knew that this was all an act. Nearing evening, they bid farewell to each other's tribe. Lockrack also managed to witness Shunin saying something to Owen and the lizard man looks like he's stuck between a rock and a hard place. Lockrack is sure that the lizard man and the frogman are not on good terms. The scene skipped to the frogman village with Owen getting slapped by Shunin. He demanded the contents of the conversation Owen had with Lockrack. Owen desperately said that they're just talking about archery. The guard kicks him, saying that Owen doesn't even know archery. But isn't it less suspicious if I say that I can shoot? Owen is in pain but his brain is still smart. Owen said that he told Lockrack he needed to pay a fee to learn and Lockrack mentioned that he didn't have anything valuable and left. Shunin snarkily complimented the bargain of Owen. He reminded him of what's on the little isolated island in the middle of the lake. That island has all the lizardmen's offspring held hostage, including Owen's son. His son is always spared from the sacrifice and that's how Shunin gets Owen to do whatever his bidding is, even betraying his own kind. At night, Owen stared at the isolated island, 
regretting taking the hand of the sly frogman in the past. He regretted letting his tribe go to that island and letting their warriors do a supposed brotherly ritual. Now, there are only 200 lizardmen left and 1,500 frogmen. In addition, the frogmen have a two-headed serpent as their god. The lizardmen never stood a chance. They call it the two-headed fiend. Owen thought that Lokrak seemed strong but he only has 600 lizardmen, furthermore, they are all country bumpkins. Owen plans to sacrifice Lokrak's tribe so that his tribe and his son can live longer. The next day, Shunan was rejoiced with a live water buffalo in front of him. Lokrak mentioned trading it with a bow again. Owen suggested they know each other better first and have a tour in each of their villages. After that, they perhaps can give them a bow as a souvenir. After the frogmen left, Lokrak continued experimenting on the bow they made. For some reason, the frogman's bow still can shoot arrows further. Lokrak wanted to know what creature's tendons their bowstrings are extracted from. Lokrak and Zael are also sus about the frogman's supposed friendship. Either way, they need to proceed with caution. They had also gathered the herb that cures frogman's itchiness, Lokrak hopes that Owen can be trusted. Zael suggested giving the guy a chance to earn their trust. Meanwhile, Owen was getting a headlock by the frogman guard because Lokrak's group isn't taking the bait to tour their village. Shunan threatened and told Owen that his father is going to quicken the live sacrifice ceremony. Owen asked the reason for doing so and Shunan said that it was because his father and the elders were getting sicker. It was an itchiness disease. This is top secret but Shunan trusts Owen still, the disease isn't only itchy, it accompanies with a white mucus that continues to expand until it becomes hard to breathe. After that, they will suffocate to death. It's Owen's first time hearing about a disease like this. He guessed that Shunan is testing him and he needs to keep acting worried. Owen suggested that they can pacify the lizardmen by telling them that this disease can be spread to lizardmen too. They can use plants that produce white foam when crushed to pretend that it's the mucus. Owen also offered himself to be that said actor. That's how he gained Shunan's trust. Shunan added that if Owen could get the black-scaled lizardmen here, his son would be exempt from the sacrifice. Owen also suggests that the negotiations will be easier if they bring bows but Shunan isn't fond of the idea. The next day, Lokrak asked if all his herb to cure itchiness still isn't enough to trade for a bow. Shunan says that weapon trading is complicated and requires them to show some more faith. Lokrak thought for a while and requested to speak with Owen in private. Shunan approves the private meeting. Owen told Lokrak that their tribe performed a brotherly ritual with the frogmen. If Lokrak tells him about his tribe then Owen will tell him about the frogmen. Suddenly, Lokrak noticed Nebula's butterfly perched on top of Owen's head. Owen shooed the butterfly away. Seeing that even his god is trusting Owen, Lokrak decided to put his trust in this lizard man too. With that, Owen managed to fulfill his mission of bringing the Lokrak tribe to the frogman village. Before this, Lokrak even gave them a tour around his village and the guard thought that it was dumb of them too. They managed to know that Lokrak has only 300 members with only 30 being warriors. Shunan praised Owen for his job well done. Owen only wanted Shunan to exclude his son from the sacrifice and Shunan says that he'll remember it. After that, Owen is back to staring at the isolated island. Before, Lokrak taught him their letters, that an X sign means no or refusal, and a V with a tail means that it's a lie or fake. Owen also suggested putting the characters together to form a truth or not a lie. Lokrak complimented Owen's smart brain. Owen suddenly recalls Shunan also complimented his smarts. Yet, he wondered why Lokrak showed their letters to him and not the frogman. Lokrak explained that it's because of faith. Instead of the frogman, he wants to build faith between him and Owen. The lizard man has mixed feelings about this. Lokrak said that all his tribe members know what pain is and the difference between a predator and prey. He knows that Owen is currently suffering. Owen wonders why Lokrak put his trust in a bargainer like him. The next day is the day that Lokrak's tribe arrived at the frogman village. Shunan greeted them in open arms, Lokrak apologized for bringing weapons into the village as he was afraid to encounter cockatrice along the way. Shunan mentally scoffs and plans to poison Lokrak's group during the feast. Lokrak asked for Owen and Shunan call out to him. The lizard man was helping with banquet preparation and is writing something on the ground. 
Lockrack greeted Owen and he told Lockrack and the group to sit at the seats that were labeled with a letter. All the seats were labeled with the letter, lie, on the ground. Lockrack called out to Yuri and told him to begin their plan as he wore his skull helmet. Without hesitation, Yuri shot an archer frogman with his spear. The frogmen were taken aback from the sudden death. Lockrack ordered for all frogmen to be killed. After a while, they managed to rid off most frogmen in this area but Shunan and some frogmen warriors fled. Lockrack wanted Owen to do something for him. Meanwhile, Shunan and his archers armed themselves with poison arrows. Shunan wants their lizardmen to hold off Lockrack's group while the frogmen prepare for war. Before that, he wants to reduce their numbers until reinforcements arrive. Poison arrows from poisonous frogs were released. However, Lockrack's group had their shield up and deflected the attacks. Shunan ordered them to hold fire and only shoot when they started getting near them. Suddenly, he noticed smoke in the air and because of the smoke disrupting their vision, their accuracy lessens. Owen was burning down their own lizardmen village and his tribesmen panicked. The lizardman asked if Shunan told him to burn the village but Owen honestly said that the black-scaled lizardmen told him to do so. Owen told them to trust the black-scaled lizardmen, but the tribesmen are having doubts and they don't trust Owen either. Owen firmly said that he is betting his all on this. Meanwhile, looking at the burning lizardmen village, Shunan confirms that Owen had betrayed them. Shunan told his warriors to retreat for now. To get rid of Lokrak's group, they need the help of a stronger being in the lake. The frogman warrior Oboy counted, they have 45 warriors which is still more than Lokrak's 30 warriors. He ordered them to douse their arrows with poison while they await Shunan's group. Suddenly, Oboy felt movement in the bushes and he readied his arrow. His instincts are warning him to run away immediately. As soon as they caught a glimpse of the creature, he ordered everyone to release their arrows. Much to their dismay, the arrows are no match for Manon that Zael brought. Manon spat out the poisonous arrow and hissed at the frogman. Zael told Manon to feast his eyes on the frog dinner in front. Manon charged and gobbled one of the frogmen as oh boy dodged. It's a monster that can't even be compared to a cockatrice. Oh boy decided to increase the poison dosage and threw a poisonous frog towards Manon. It ate the treat and Oboy shouted for everyone to toss their poisonous frogs to the drake. Manon is having a feast. Zael wondered why the frogmen were throwing free snacks to Manon. If they were thinking of bribing Manon, it was already too late. The third blessing of the black-scaled lizardmen is toxin resistance. At that moment, Oboy knew that he was just food for Manon. At the same time, a frogman shot an arrow towards Lockrack and he casually snapped it in half with his tail. After dealing with that frog, Yuri guessed that Shunan had left the village. That's why the grayish-brown lizardmen started attacking the frogmen. Still, Lokrak wondered why didn't their great leader Aloy show up even when they caused so much chaos. However, that's because of our MC here. He obtained a diseased mycelium that solely affects amphibian mucous membranes and is highly contagious and fatal. Nebula had a hard time finding that disease. However, he found it a few hundred kilometers away from the lizardman's oasis and was able to transport it to the frogman village thanks to the insects. He dropped the disease onto the strong tribal chief Aloy. After that, Aloy has been obsessed with sacrificial rituals in hope to cure his disease. At the isolated island, Aloy called out to the two-headed fiend with young lizardmen as sacrifices. Hearing the drums for the sacrificial ritual from the island, Shunan stated that they have won this battle. Owen rushed towards Lokrak and shouted that they needed to head to the isolated island in the lake immediately. He shouted that the lizardman's children are going to be sacrificed to the frogman's god. The god might not be able to heal illnesses but it is very strong. Lokrak asks why is Owen telling him right now when the security is at its highest. Owen begged them to save his son. Lokrak got angry and punched Owen, saying that he should have told them earlier, if it's the frogman's god he's worried about, Lokrak could show them who's the real god. Even so, he wished that Owen would tell him sooner. They would know Shunan's intentions a little earlier if Owen had told them about this. The two-headed serpent surfaced and Aloy rejoiced. He offered the sacrifices and wanted their god to get rid of all the lizardmen. Owen could only watch helplessly at the other side of the lake. Lokrak observed the creature that's bigger than the centipede, 
they don't have the terrain advantage right now and was going to let the horrifying events unfold. At that moment, Nebula's butterfly flew by. Lockrack tells Owen to lift his head up and asks if he believes in miracles. In front of them, there was a humongous praying mantis that's even bigger than the two-headed fiend. While offering the sacrifices to the two-headed fiend, Shunan noticed that their god wasn't gobbling the food instantly like always, and was looking straight ahead. He followed the serpent's gaze and his gaze met with a giant praying mantis. Just the landing of this creature is enough to send the ground shaking. The frogman cried that the mantis is a god. The praying mantis was created meticulously by Nebula from the combination of his divinity level, faith, and the abomination essence. He is proud that he is one of the early ones to obtain this creature at this point in the game. The serpent tried to get a chomp on this creature but the mantis easily shut the serpent's trap. The frogmen scattered for their lives and the lizardmen children cried for their parents. However, Alloy still believes that their two-headed fiend will win the match. Yet, it was a pipe dream as the snake was slashed in half. The praying mantis crushed any hope that's left in the frogman. The creature offered the serpent to its creator. It became a sacrificial ritual for Nebula rather than the frogman. The differences in power are absolutely startling. The two-headed beast has a level 4 serpent and level 3 beast, it has 163 strength, 33 intelligence, 8 sociability, all with plus 2 divinity, a deviousness of 4 and its phylum is unknown. The praying mantis or Sratus has a level 11 creature, 220 strength, 32 intelligence, 22 sociability, all with a plus 3 divinity, and has a monstrosity skill. It was an overwhelming victory for Lockrack's group. Although the fiend looked pretty strong but it couldn't use its phylum and Nebula rolled a good skill for Sratus, he hopes that he didn't use up his luck. Nebula acquired another essence from the fiend and an unknown phylum. He did another gotcha pull for the phylum. He rolled an ocean phylum, which isn't bad but isn't usable at the moment. At one side, Alloy was literally going gaga when he witnessed the serpent's death. Alloy's tribe started to go downhill because he was smitten by the serpent's strength and thought they would be safe forever. The warriors stopped training and stood behind the serpent and became cowards over time. Nebula complimented Sratus a job well done and the creature was dismissed until next mission arrives. Now that the serpent was taken care of, Nebula wondered what Lockrack's next step would be. The frogmen retreated upwards and they could finally swim across. Owen wanted to follow them to the island. On top of that, the other grayish-brown lizardmen would like to assist Lockrack too. Although they are not full-fledged warriors, every villager here has a bone to pick with the frogmen. They are all angry and needed an outlet, they need to eradicate the frogmen to avenge their friends and families. Lockrack acknowledged them and shouted for all lizardmen who seek vengeance to follow him. Before this, Shunan and Lockrack have discussed how hitting a moving target is harder than a still target. Shunan even taught him to slow down or stop the target first before shooting. But the conversation about making a bow in the future felt off to Lockrack, as Shunan said sarcastically that even lizardmen can easily get the necessary materials for the bow. Lockrack felt an ominous feeling back then but now, he can hear it from the frogman directly. Upon arriving on the island, the grayish-brown lizardmen all rushed towards their kids. Lockrack wanted Yuri to bring the grayish-brown lizardmen to their village to confuse the frogmen while he and some warriors ambushed them from across the lake. They can swim across stealthily as their black scales will look like ripples sparkling under the moonlight thanks to the blessing. As expected, the frogmen were taken aback from the sudden ambush. With a swing of his spear, Lockrack could take down three frogmen at once. Alloy, who's still living in his own fantasy, shouted for the two-headed serpent to help them. He was swiftly dealt with by Lockrack. Shunan, on the other hand, took off his feathery outfit to look like a normal frogman in hiding. He is out of choices as poison doesn't even work against Lockrack's group. Soon, he was found by Lockrack. Lockrack told him to fight like a warrior but the frogman didn't care about any warrior honor as he just wanted to live. He desperately shouted that they did all these because they were threatened by the serpent. Shunan tries to trade his life with the ingredients of the bow, he said the bowstrings were made from a living being's tendons, it was the tendons of lizardmen. Shunan instantly realized that he personally dug his own grave. Lockrack let the frogmen go as it was part of the deal. Shunan ran for his life, but Lockrack aimed his arrow towards him. 
he needed to practice on a moving target after all. The next day, Lockrack is practicing on his bow. The bowstrings were replaced with a different material which is not lizardman tendons that's for sure. However, they still need to find stronger materials than this as it snaps when pulled further. They will also need to migrate to a warmer place as winter is coming. Here, Owen disclosed that the bowstrings materials used were frogman tendons, an eye for an eye for real. That night, Shunan was shot on the leg and lost his balance. After that, he was mauled to death by the angry grayish-brown lizardmen mob. Aloy met the same fate as his son, and their skull bones were worn. Owen is wearing Shunan's skull by the way. While Owen was reporting to Lockrack, Zael found Owen's son, Ian, hiding behind a tree. Little Ian nearly had a heart attack and dropped his sculpture. The sculpture was in the shape of Sratus. Zael showed it to Lockrack and Owen, Lockrack complimented the craftsmanship and little Ian lit up. Ian wanted to give it to Lockrack and Owen explained that it's a trend amongst children to give each other handmade figurines. Every kid in the village owns this, because their guardian is an amazing being who saved them. Lockrack wanted everyone to have them, he would buy it off of them or barter trade it. Owen then continued his report that they found something strange in the frogman's hiding cave. Therefore, they ventured into that said cave, and Lockrack saw Nebula's butterfly flying above. In front of them, was a round stone slab with carvings. Zael and Lockrack found it similar to the pattern on the back of the beetle. Apparently, they found an ancient ruin. Nebula explained to the readers that there are various types of ruins, you can gain ancient knowledge, discover treasures, gain special ability items or discover items with a demonic nature. However, it's not too important right now as civilization is still in the primal stages. To add to that, ruins that can create, change materials or grant blessings are usually at a fixed location, which is useless to the nomadic Lockrack tribe. If it doesn't have a demonic nature, there's a low chance that it's a unique relic. But well, it turns out to be said demonic nature as it welcomes them to the demonic world. The group ventured into the demonic world filled with stairs. It's seriously a long fall down. Going down the steps, they were met with a large amount of rats. Zael recognized these rats to be Nutria which they ate before but these are a lot bigger. Additionally, these ones move in packs and are more aggressive. Lockrack guessed that these rats are protecting the place and instructed everyone to prepare for combat. Thus, the Battle of Lizards and Rats commenced. After finishing the battle, Lockrack wondered if they could consume such a creature. Zael asked if they should tame the rats like the buffaloes and Owen added raising fishes to the list. He suggested building a dam and trap the fishes inside during hatching season. Suddenly one of the lizardmen was zapped by the dead rat. He was trying to cut it open when it buzzed his hand and it hurted. Lockrack tried the buzz and it was literally shocking. His wife was worried but he is fine. The Nutria has a demonic energy attribute of lightning and can attack enemies with lightning through physical contact. Nebula was hoping that it wasn't a demonic ruin but he just had to jinx it. Although lightning is a weaker attribute amongst other demonic ones, Lockrack might obtain demonic power if he ventures down. Nevertheless, Lockrack won't become a mage so soon, as the demonic power gets stronger by generation, future generations will produce mages. Yet, magic and divine power are conflicted. Based on the game, magic comes from ancient evil and people might lose faith in God. A lightning manta spirit revealed itself to Lockrack. It asks if Lockrack wishes for power. Lockrack noticed that he's the only one who could see this manta. Even the manta confirmed his suspicions. Nebula wondered if he should warn his apostle about the demonic spirit. Before he could do that, Nebula noticed that his apostle had 18 deception stat. RMC wondered if he obtained that skill when dealing with Shunin and would like to let Lockrack handle this himself. Lockrack wanted to accept the deal but he's uninterested when the manta added conditions. He called the manta, Buzz, and stated that it should act accordingly if it wanted his help. Lockrack wanted the manta to be honest with what the condition is and what Lockrack would be obtaining. The manta wants Lockrack to clear the ruins and free it, then he will obtain the lightning. The manta explained that its power is called, electricity. The more Lockrack uses it, the stronger it gets which can even rival gods. It stated that Lockrack can either monopolize the power or share it with his tribe through a ritual. 
Lockrack asked why is the mantan imprisoned if it's that strong and it said that's because people fears a dangerous being. You know what Buzz, you've just revealed yourself to be dangerous. Lockrack said and the manta gasped. Lockrack threatens to bury this cave if it doesn't tell the full truth. The frantic manta told a story about the rulers of an ancient past, the forgotten demons that neither gods nor the manta knows their origins. While God's power is bestowed by chance, the demonic spirit's power is indiscriminate and could also grow even stronger with time. Lockrack smartly guessed that eventually, there will be those who turn their backs on God if they obtain this said power. However, it is undoubtedly useful in battle. Lockrack stated his conditions. Lockrack asked if it is possible to give that power to a selected few to which the manta replied it could. Lockrack wanted to make it look as if the selected few were chosen by God, as a result, they won't rebel against God. Next, he wants the manta to believe in Nebula too. The manta said that it's a demonic spirit and besides, gods don't like demonic spirits. Lockrack said that his god is a generous being and the manta seemed useful too. The manta asked if Lockrack is not angry that it sent its rat minions to attack them. Lockrack says that he understands as the manta was just cranky to be cooped here for so long. He said that it was just itching to touch grass and see the world. The manta asked Lockrack his name and he told it. The manta said if their god accepts it, its power will be Lockrack's. A system window popped up at Nebula's end, stating that if he wants to accept the demonic spirit and the demonic realm of electricity. Nebula accepted it. He thought that both Lockrack and himself were lucky to have met each other. Nine years later, a story was told to a human that the blue insect god gave Lockrack the power of thunder and that chosen ones were selected. Although the man still doesn't get why a blue insect god needed to bestow blue lightning, but what can he say? The man introduced himself as Wei and wanted to know the storyteller's name. However, the storyteller was distracted by a distant knoll pack. The storyteller asked Wei's opinion on the knolls being Sawkate's men. Wei took in the poor appearance of the knolls and deemed them just a bunch of vagabonds. That's what I think too. The storyteller turns out to be Owen as he aimed his lightning arrow towards the pack. The lightning arrow was shot, startling the gnolls. Before they could do anything, they were thunderstruck literally. They were baffled that the chosen one shot them and ran away. Owen then introduces himself to Wei, and the man was shocked to see a big shot here. Owen told the man that he can say whatever he wants. Wei asked why Owen is working under someone when he's that skilled. He's not asking Owen to betray anyone, he just wants to know why he is living in the wilderness. Owen said that he's a sinful creature that once betrayed his people. Thus, he's atoning for his sins by spreading their religion. Wei thought that he didn't have to do that as the black-scaled lizard men are famous. Wei said that he's a wanderer from the city of automation. He wants to deliver a word of their lord to the black-scaled lizard men. Owen whistled and his ride came. Wei thought that it's a cockatrice but this is a cockatoo, a crossbreed between cockatrice and a chicken. Owen invited Wei to ride with him to go meet Lockrack. At night, Lockrack's group, which has grown significantly bigger, migrates through the wilderness. Lockrack has become even more seasoned throughout the years. It was also the day that the stargazer's life soon reaches the end. Lockrack instructed them to rest here for the night as he visited the stargazer one last time. He told Zael about the news and wanted her to arrange the funeral. It was going to be a night of mourning. Lockrack came to visit the stargazer's tent, and an attendant told him that the stargazer has lived a very long time and is now tired. The stargazer started reminiscing about his past. He has traveled and learned many things, he was ostracized after he lost an arm, but he found Lockrack and taught many people astrology. However, nobody can combat old age. Only eternal sleep can combat this supposed disease. The stargazer even joked that he got to steal the valuable time of their tribal chief to visit him. He wanted to ask Lockrack a question specific to him. What comes after death? He wanted to ask Lockrack this, as Lockrack is closest to God. He wondered if it's called eternal sleep, do they dream eternally? Since it's a dream, will they have an eternal nightmare? Lockrack doesn't know this either and wonders why does the stargazer thinks he is qualified to answer. Since their god showed them the way when they are lost, the stargazer wonders if he will accept them after death. 
Lockrack assures him that their god would still guide them after death. The stargazer wonders what the afterlife looks like. Lockrack guessed that it's like a prairie where they can run around with the sound of wind and the comfortable grass under their feet. There must also be a rock for them to rest when tired, the changes of weather and a river. The stargazer wanted a stable home that is not a wobbly tent to call home there. He never liked tents much and just wanted a place to settle down. The stargazer wonders if there will be stars in the afterlife and Lockrack is sure that their god placed stars there for them to find their way home. Suddenly, Lockrack noticed Nebula's butterfly and exclaimed for the stargazer to see it. However, the lizardman's vision is getting darker. Lockrack held in his tears and the butterfly went to retrieve the departed. After that, the stargazer left the mortal realm along with Nebula's butterfly. It flies back delivering the soul to Nebula. A system window popped up informing that Nebula is eligible to create an afterlife and so, he did. It is crucial to build a good afterlife in perished world. Similar to the concept of heaven and hell where you reward those who do good and punish sinners. The afterlife can also be used as a training ground because it is possible to send these warriors back to the real world at a later date. But Nebula doesn't need to be impatient right now, as the afterlife can be expanded further in the future. He released the soul butterflies to the primordial prairie he created. The butterfly slowly landed on this lush green land with a blue sky. The souls morphed into the lizardman's younger self. The stargazer was awoken by the bright sunlight. He sat up and saw a vast grassland unfold in front of his eyes. The stargazer was amazed. It was the same picture he and Lockrack imagined together. Though there's no stone to rest or solid houses, it is a green prairie through and through. While the lizard man is humming a tune, he notices that there's also other departed lizard men there too. Though they are still sound asleep. The stargazer noticed one of the warriors that learned arithmetic from him. It was during a surprise attack from the goblins that targeted their most vulnerable area that consists of children and elderly. That warrior stood up and defended them. The warriors of the Black Scale tribe could defy the chief's commands if they deemed it necessary. It was a heroic sacrifice no one wished for. During the funeral for warriors, Lockrack was furious about the warriors who learnt arithmetic as they think sacrificing one to save two is good. The stargazer asked if Lockrack thinks the warriors did wrong but Lockrack said no. He is mad that they are correct and Lockrack could only be angry at times like these. Because of this warrior hero sacrifice, other warriors also began learning arithmetic. The stargazer is happy to meet this child again. While wondering where their god was, the stargazer spotted someone behind the trees and went to chase them. The figure led him to a stone building with glass roofing. If there's a god here, he wishes to ask some questions. Why did they choose them? Is it because lizard men were superior or was it because god was benevolent? Or was it because they are useful? He saw the blue butterfly at the end of the tunnel. Lockrack said that God chose them by chance though that reason is good too. Walking towards the tunnel's end led the stargazer to an observatory. He was amazed once more that Lockrack is correct about stone houses and stars. He went to check on the telescope, he was astounded to be able to observe stars in such close proximity. He wanted to recalculate the movement of the stars as everything he knew was just the tip of the iceberg. The stargazer thought that it would be awesome if he could tell his findings to the living. Nebula observed the stargazer from behind, the beliefs of their god shapes the values of their followers. For Vikings, it will be a paradise called Valhalla, for cultivators, it will be a peach blossom spring. But what would happen if a scholar enters the afterlife? Nebula wanted his afterlife to function immediately as there were new threats. The Clipdeer tribe who has advanced ironworking skills and the ability to tame the formidable Gamchi beast is coming for the weaker lizardmen tribe. Because the technological prowess and movements are extraordinary, Nebula guessed that there's a player behind them. However, RMC isn't ranked number one for nothing. He too, has strategies to combat the adversaries. The players are slowly expanding their territories, that's why Nebula prepared three large swarms of locusts colonies, that counters players who rely on agriculture and at the same time hides his existence. He also has insect hosts who are currently filling up the list of diseases. Lastly, he also has the nest that breeds various insects and is responsible for farming experience. 
Moreover, Lockrack is slowly uniting different lizardmen tribes into his. It won't be long until Nebula controls the southern peninsula and only has to deal with the player that manipulates the gnolls. When Owen arrived with Wei, he was informed of the death of the Stargazer. Wei says that it's okay to fix another date but Owen says that they don't mind travelers attending the funeral, in fact it's a blessing to have someone share the grief. They were brought to the funeral location, Wei caught a glimpse of Lockrack shedding tears. He asked if it's okay for the chief to shed tears in front of others as it's a matter of dignity. Owen understands the human concept of not showing weakness to the subordinates. However, Owen advises not to bring that up because there's something lizardmen values more than dignity. Before Wei could ask more, Owen greeted Lockrack and introduced Wei to him. Wei formally introduced himself to Lockrack too. Lockrack invites the man into the tent and hopes that they get straight to business. Wei presented a gift to Lockrack from the automation castle. Lockrack opened and saw that it's rock salt. The man proudly said that it's the first piece of rock salt given by the Lord without expecting anything in return. By first, you meant there will be a second and a third. Lockrack asked and the man assured him that there's more to come. Lockrack crushed the rock salt, earning a dumbfounded look from Wei. Lockrack dusted his salty hands and wanted Wei to convey his thanks to his Lord. Lockrack said that crushing and scattering salt is just a sacrificial ritual but Wei knows that it's a lie. Wei tried to get the lizard man to ally with them but Lockrack politely refused. Lockrack doesn't like the roundabout way of talking and would prefer to directly talk it out. Wei asked the reason for refusal. Lockrack said he doesn't like a pickup proposal that someone else has refused as it must be lacking if the previous party refused it. Wei tried to play dumb but Lockrack already knew from Owen. The lizard man told him that Wei came from the north, not the west where the automation castle is situated. The North is where the Severed Ears tribe, the Sockate resides and they also refused his proposal. Lockrack wanted a proper conversation with not Wei, but as Wei Seo, the Lord of Automation Castle. The Automation Castle is an ancient historical site. Though it's made of mud but it's a real fortress with 5-meter walls that can't be found in this era. They even have mud golems maintaining the castle. Inside, humans coexist with a variety of other tribes. It also has geographical advantages, the mountain valley of the castle is on the path to enter the continent. Thus, to enter the main continent, you need to secure the automation castle first. There's also a salt mine which is useful for livestock and food resources. Lockrack explained why he guessed that that was his identity. Lockrack explained that Wei revealed half of his name to see how knowledgeable the lizard men are about the automation castle. The Lord's face is only known by a few, even to the four families who pledge loyalty to the Lord. To them, the name Wei is a name shared by those who inherited the Lord's bloodline. Lockrack said that the Lord has four sons and four daughters and judging by his appearance, he could only be the Lord, Wei Seo. The man complimented Lockrack and admitted that he is indeed the Lord, Wei Seo. Lockrack said the reason Wei Seo is offering rock salt is to gain protection. Whether provoked by external forces or by the automation castle themselves, the lizardmen needed to provide protection. Wei Seo asked why Lockrack is refusing a beneficial trade like this. Lockrack asked if he had heard something along the lines of, why don't we drive out the humans and gain both rock salt and automation castle? Wei asked if Lockrack is declaring war right now but the lizard man is just giving the easiest and straightforward example. Wei said to not take the automation castle lightly. However, Lockrack said that if their god helps, they could easily break down the five-meter walls. Besides, the lord of the castle is right here in a potential enemy barrack. Wei is sure that Lockrack won't kill him now, because they won't know who the heir of the castle is if he dies. Lockrack asked why he should care about the successor. Wei said that they are all like in a game of Go. The game involving two gods and two tribes. Wei said that his children mentioned about teeth gnashing with rage and pale blue butterflies. The gods of the two tribes had already been involved in this game of chess. Three weeks ago, Nebula got a notification for a challenge between civilization. It was from Hegemony that clashed with Nebula during the beta game. Hegemony wanted a rematch this time and Nebula asked who's gonna benefit if rank 1 and 2 clashed right from the start. Nebula told Hegemony that this isn't a game anymore. The dude knows that but he's trying to be positive. Nebula is familiar with Hegemony's playstyle. 
The dude looks simple but he is a pro in small-scale battles and multitasking. He is also often seen to gain profit if he fights in the early game. Nevertheless, both of them wanted Automation Castle right now. So, they triggered a contradictory prophecy. Prophecy requires at least level 6 divinity to cast, where you gain extra experience once the quest is complete. However, failing to fulfill a prophecy will result in a penalty. Either you lose EXP points for all the faith you have, a greater penalty, or a plague event upon your civilization. A contradictory penalty is where the winner gets the reward and the loser gets the penalty. Nebula suggested that they set up a contradictory prophecy on who will be the next successor. They will each choose one child out of the five legitimate children as the other three aren't eligible because they are illegitimate. Hegemony kindly gave Nebula the list of children and explained. First is Dan, who's in his early 30s, he is strong, intelligent and the favorite child, with two of the four main families supporting him. The second, June, who's in his late 20s, he is Dan's half-brother and is well known for being weak, he keeps a low profile and has no interest in the succession, he is supported by one family on his mother's side. Third, Jean, who's in her late 20s and is Dan's biological sister. She travels using an alias and is well-liked by hunters and vagabonds, she is supported by the last family. Fourth, Kyung, who's in her early 20s, her mother died and she has an unusual appearance which made her shunned by the family including the Lord. The fifth, Min, who is in her mid-teens. She is a talented and bright child, because she's the youngest, the Lord favors her as well. Hegemony told Nebula to pick one. The contradictory prophecy between Nebula and Hegemony was written. Hegemony chose the second child, Wei Jun, the infamous weak child. Nebula chose the fourth child, Wei Kyung, the supposed cursed child. Nebula noticed that Hegemony was taken aback with his choice. And so, the contradictory prophecy between the two has been established. We are back in the present, Wei Seo came to confirm the rumors but seeing that he is still alive after seeing two chieftains of different tribes made the man certain that he is just a piece on the board. Lockrack said that it's just a matter of choice, gnolls or lizardmen, the god of gnashing teeth or the blue insect god. Wei said that it's like choosing between a cockatoo or a saber-toothed tiger. The man chose neither to stand by. Before Wei left, he asked if Lockrack was afraid of being a piece on the game board. The lizard man will answer that question after all of this is done. With that, Wei Seo left and his guards came to escort him back. While riding back, his escorts noticed that Wei Seo is shedding tears. We went back to three weeks ago, Wei Kyung was cursing and clinging for dear life on the cliff. She is relieved that her silks are fine from the fall. Now, the problem at hand is how she is going to climb up the cliff with a sprained ankle. Hyung was always told that she was cursed because of her horns on her forehead. She fell down the stairs at 13, accused as a salt thief and locked up for four days at 14, fell through the bathroom floor at 15, I'd say the worst one is 15 huh? She was always plagued with misfortune growing up, so hanging for dear life on the edge of the cliff is nothing. To hell with that, this girl is mad that her friend lended her a broken cart. As she was trying her best to climb up, someone called for her. She looks up and there's a lizard man extending his hand to her, and also trying to riz her up. The girl is confused and says that she has no money to repay him. The lizard man reassured her that he didn't need anything and helped her up. The lizard man said that she's very bold for taking this dangerous road with a cart full of goods. She asked him his name and he said that it's Siran Newell. Kyung thanked him and tried to leave. However, Siran stopped her, stating that his business isn't done and called her name. The girl was in full alert mode as she grabbed her hidden knife. Siran put his hands in the air and told her chief Lockrack told him to find her. Kyung is confused why someone that famous is looking for her. Siran explained that it's because of the two rumors circulating Automation Castle. Kyung is unaware of said rumors. Siran told her about the rumors that the second child or the fourth child is to succeed the castle. Kyung deemed it to be false as she's a bastard child and Sai Ran is better off finding her other siblings. Kyung is anxious that Sai Ran knows her identity too well although it's supposed to be top secret. She thought about killing Sai Ran here but Sai Ran told her he is tasked to protect her life. The girl was taken aback once more, she doesn't need any protection but Sai Ran is acting on orders. Sai Ran noticed the bases of her horns, 
she said that she was a cursed child that killed her mom and one of her siblings. Siran is sorry to hear that but he is acting on their chief's orders. Since the lizard man isn't budging, she doesn't mind having an extra pair of strong hands. Kyung wanted to retrieve her silk but Siran knew that her ankle was sprained and told her to just ask for his help. The girl blushed, shoved down her embarrassment and asked for Saren's help. While traversing back, Kyung asked how he knew her location. Siran tracked her by her alias, Mingzi. Apparently her associates also sold her information for free. Siran was told that Kyung wanted to start a silk business and her associate even thought he was scammed when the cart was never returned after a few days of her disappearance. The girl held in her embarrassment again. Suddenly, the girl was nearly assassinated but Siran caught the daggers with his bare hand. The battle of succession has already begun. The goblin assassination team was caught. Siran learned his fighting techniques from their best warrior, Yur. And for some reason, Siran is using the first aid skills he learned from Zael to heal the assassins. Siran was once an errand boy for Zael. Kyung could confirm that this Siran kid holds a significant position in the Blackscale tribe. Kyung calculated that it's beneficial for her to be protected by such an important figure. Though she was quite sad when he used her silks to make peace with the goblins. Going towards the castle gate, they noticed that the guards were preventing entry to outsiders. A fox merchant informs her that they are preventing people from entering and exiting the castle. Something has happened inside the castle. However, Wei Kyung managed to arrive at the Gyo family and complained about the broken cart Gyo Jung lent. Kyung introduced Sai Ran who saved her from an assassination attempt to Gyo Jung. The lizard man introduced himself, and Gyo Jung introduced himself as the leader of Gyo and one of the four families in the castle. Siran said the goblins testified that the Gyo family isn't involved with the assassination. Gyo Jung isn't fond of using dirty tricks anyways. Apparently, there was an assassination that occurred in the castle too and the eldest brother Wei Dan went missing. And so, they went to check the crime scene. They found traces of blood being wiped. Gyo Jung said that Dan is dead and there is evidence supporting his death as well. But his body was never found. They blocked out entering and exiting so that the corpse won't be taken out. They wanted to wait until the corpse started to smell then they could sniff out the culprit. Wei Kyung wanted to stay out of this like Gyo Jung told her to, but suddenly a voice in her head asked if she's really going to take no action again. Siran noticed her abnormalities and asked if she's okay. The girl asked what kind of people possessed pot that could prevent meat from rotting and not be suspected. Detective Kyung narrowed it down to someone who can easily take a hunter with them, has a lot of meat preserved in salt within their pots at home, and someone who can naturally visit Dan's office. The most possible suspect is the third child, Wei Jin. Thus, the culprit's name is spread among the citizens. Third sister Wei Jin tried to escape through the mountains. However, she was stopped by the youngest, Wei Min. Except for Kyung, everyone in this family wants to kill each other, huh? Wei Jin glared at the youngest but Wei Min smiled and said that Jin has no right to be angry as she started killing first. The youngest wanted to end this cursed sibling relationship and Wei Jin was shot. The youngest mourned but suddenly she was stabbed from behind. She didn't expect that there's a hyena behind, and that's the second son, Wei Jun, who was chosen by hegemony. Now, he only has one sibling left to kill. The next day, three of the sibling corpses were found, which pinpoints Kyung's next attacker. Kyung correctly pieced out the events that happened between the three siblings' deaths. She also guessed that Jun was the one who sent the goblin assassins to her. Gyo Jung told her that the Gyo family had a meeting recently. As people are rooting for Wei Jun, the Gyo family decided to bet on her. It was a calculative decision and the girl casually thanked him. Gyo Jung rooted for her survival and the girl left. It's the very first time someone believes in her so she wants to meet their expectations. And so, she attended the meeting about how to deal with Wei Jun and his supporting family. Kyung's horns had grown longer which made her uncomfortable. Siran told her to forget about cutting them. He nearly got a heart attack when she bled so much trying to cut it. However, the girl is not trying to talk about her horns. She just can't get used to her current position right now compared to a few days ago. Suddenly, someone reported that the lord of the castle is returning. As he isn't in a rush, 
they deduced the Lord will arrive tomorrow morning. After that, the man tried to secretly tell Wei Kyung something. Yet, he was stabbed by Sai Ran and a goblin because he was attempting to assassinate Kyung. The man was from the Gyo family but he was bribed, they couldn't trust the members in the Gyo family anymore. At that moment, they heard a commotion outside. It was Wei Jun's army trying to end things before the Lord arrived. And so, Kyung and Sai Ran had to escape through the smelly sewage system. Before Sai Ran could say anything, Kyung jumped in first and urged him to follow suit. The lizard man commented that she has a strong stomach. She nearly died a smelly death falling into the sewage system when she's younger. She suspected the flooring to be rotten and she fell into poop. Surprisingly, she wasn't hurt but it was dark. But she saw balls of light in the air and followed them. Taking a closer look, the balls of light were from fireflies. Siran told her that fireflies don't live down here but the girl said that she even caught one herself. Siran found her encounter fascinating but he doesn't want to argue more. Finally, they arrived at the exit. Siran said that this door connects to the Su family's hunter's hut basement. He will go up first and if he doesn't return after a while, he wants her to immediately run in the opposite direction. The girl waited and waited, when suddenly she heard a sound and rushed up. Kyung remembered Saren's warnings but she didn't want to sit still and watch people die anymore. She saw the lizard man outside the door and shouted for him. Sai Ran was astonished that she's here. The lizard man has a spear penetrated into him. This s Wei Jun brought his minions to ambush them. He ordered his minions to ignore the wounded Sai Ran and go for Wei Kyung instead. The lizard man showed them what will happen when they ignore him. Sai Ran broke the handle of the spear that's penetrating him and asked why is Kyung here instead of running away. Kyung said she knows it's a wrong choice but she chooses this option even though she might die. Sai Ran told her that he received orders to protect her and not risk his life but look at him now. He said that they are both similar in that nature. Wei Jun told his minions to kill them as he will reward them accordingly. The minions are scared that Sai Ran is a chosen one but if he is, he would use it from the start. Sai Ran remembered that the wall beside them connects to the salt mine. He told Kyung that although he's not a chosen one, he is the second best warrior among the lizard men. He told Kyung to follow him as he crashed into the wall beside them and into the mines. Kyung was baffled and so was everyone. Wei Jun ordered everyone to chase after the two. Soon, Sai Ran couldn't run further cause of his injury and Kyung supported him. The two devastatingly met a dead end. Kyung suggested to pull out his spear and rest but that will just increase his blood loss. The girl cried and Sai Ran asked if she's crying for him. She said that she always brings misfortune to those around her. Sai Ran said since she defied all the misfortune and survived, he'd rather call her lucky instead. Sai Ran told her that the silk wagon last time was tempered by someone. She borrowed it from Gyo Jung even before the battle for the throne. Sai Ran also finds it weird that the toilet floor broke from a child's weight. Instead of her curse, it was more like someone targeting her life. The voice in her head said that she herself knew who tried to kill her. After that, they were found by Wei Jun's group. He ordered his minions to attack again and both Kyung and Sai Ran took their stance. Kyung gritted her teeth and stopped blaming everything on her curse and try to make a change instead. Sai Ran is betting everything on her luck to produce a miracle now. Suddenly, a green portal appeared in between the minions and the two. Both sides were confused of what's happening. The demonic manta spirit named Buzz made its appearance. Sai Ran was speechless and Kyung wondered why it was called Buzz. The spirit informed Sai Ran that he had been chosen. Wei Jun couldn't bear to watch these shenanigans anymore. He questioned his minions if they are regretting not allying with the gnolls and should shoot the spirit if they are scared. Sai Ran asked the spirit if he's adding to the five chosen ones or is he replacing someone who died. Buzz informs him that he's replacing the stargazer and Sai Ran paused. Sai Ran is also the second most courageous person in the tribe, so he is very much qualified to act as their god's proxy starting from now. After that speech, Buzz disappeared into thin air. With the monster gone, Wei Jun ordered an attack. Sai Ran pulled the spear out of his body and healed himself. He decided to show the ignorant fools who's boss. And I will leave you here, this video stopped at chapter 36. 
Why not check out this story about an MC who sponsored a pushover Duke for a personality change?